Good morning. I don't get to watch too much television anymore, but there is one show that I've followed for many, many years now. My guess is about 15 years, and that is This Old House. That's just a drop in the bucket 15 years for how long that show has been on. Its first episode, hosted by Bob Vila, premiered New Year's Day, 1979, and then they're about to start their 42nd season. So anything with that longevity should be pretty good. And if you've never seen the show, what it does is the show follows one whole house renovation over the course of several episodes. And in the early episodes, you see the contractors come in and they often have to gut out the house. That you see the floor joists, you see the rafters, your wall studs, maybe even you're seeing the footing of the house. But as the renovations progress, by the final episode, the house is done and complete. But by having seen the basic architectonic structure of the house from the beginning, by seeing those basic structures, you appreciate that final finished decorated house in a new way. In seeking to be at home in the Bible, I suggest that we too embark on something like a season of this old house. By that I mean seeing the basic structures, those basic architectonic structures to God's word his revelation to us. Just as a house is made up of many parts, many materials, but some of those materials are structural, so too does the Bible come to us in many stories, in many books, in many features. But what are those basic structures? They are the covenants. Covenants are the fundamental organizing principle of the Bible. You can easily see this just by turning to the table of contents of your Bible. There you have 39 books called the Old Testament, and then you have 27 books called the New Testament. Testament just is a word that means covenant. So our basic division is between Old Covenant and New Covenant. Yet I must admit all this talk of covenants I've long, long found very confusing and difficult because the Bible reveals a variety of covenants and each with different names. Perhaps you've heard some of these names, I give them in no particular order, that there was a covenant with Adam, a covenant of works, a covenant of redemption, a covenant with Noah, a covenant with Abraham, a covenant with David, a covenant of grace, and we also speak of the new covenant, that final covenant being the one forged in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So what is a covenant? What do I mean by this term? Here's a very basic definition. A covenant is a solemn verbal promise that legally carries, uh, legally defines a relationship of loyalty. So it is an agreement, an agreement that is a solemn promise. It carries legal weight and it defines a relationship of loyalty. And I'll add often that relationship is between two unequal partners and what is more unequal than the creator and the creature? Covenant describes our relationship with God, both, both his promises to us and then our duties and loyalties back to God. Covenants give structure to the storyline of scripture. Of all these 66 books of the Bible, to see the one story between them, it's often given as consisting of four scenes. And across these four scenes, the language of covenant just permeates. Let's review that quickly. There's four scenes, creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. In creation, God, one in being, three in persons, covenanted within himself to create the universe, all that is in it, and he created man. God then made a covenant with that first man, Adam, that he was to perform certain duties in the garden and give certain loyalties back to God. But man fell, scene two. Adam and mankind falls into sin. Sinning against God, he deserved to be destroyed. But yet God graciously, graciously grants another covenant with Adam. And this initiates a progression of covenants leading to redemption. And the third scene then is redemption. In each stage of the Old Testament covenant administration, the picture that there will be a redeemer to come grows fuller, deeper, and richer. 
After the fall of Adam and Eve, God promises that the seed of the woman would destroy the seed of the serpent. That promise is reinforced with a covenant with Noah, that common grace will extend through human history, guaranteeing success of the seed. God makes a covenant with Abraham that he will be the father of a great family, and that family will spread God's blessings to the nations. That family is constituted as a nation at Mount Sinai in the covenant with Moses. And that covenant points to a new Moses who will lead a new exodus and a true Israel, this one that would obey the Father. When that nation formally comes under the rule of King David, God makes a covenant with David. And there the promise takes the form of a triumphant son and an anointed king. And then we have the prophets. They speak that there will be a new covenant to come. The prophetic forecast of a new covenant focuses on that the promise will take a form of a servant. That servant will fulfill the promises of the covenant in his suffering. Christ Jesus is the substance of the new covenant. Then finally, the fourth scene is consummation. All of the promises of the covenant come to a great climax at the end of human history as Christ the Redeemer returns, judges the nations, ushers in the kingdom of God, and ushers in the new heavens and the new earth. So God wills covenants to function as the basic framework for all of his relationships with humankind. The Bible's teaching on covenants is central, not peripheral, to the story. But for our purposes today, there's many covenants. We'll just look at one. We're going to look at the covenant God made with Abram, later named Abraham, during that administration of the Old Covenant era, the time when the people of God were eagerly looking forward to the Messiah to come. Today we'll examine how God introduced the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12. We'll break that into two different scenes, and then we'll show how God ratified that covenant in Genesis 15, likewise breaking that into two scenes. And then in the final part of the sermon, we'll see how the promises of this covenant are ultimately fulfilled, and they are ultimately fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. For today, the big takeaway is this. This covenant with Abraham is based on divine ordination initiated in light of saving grace, of saving faith. This is a message on saving faith. So let's get into the text. In the first section, let's look at Genesis 12. In the first scene, we'll look at uh, the first three verses. But before we even get into that, let's backtrack and meet Abram for the first time. Uh, We have a genealogy in Genesis 11, and we meet Abram in 11 verse 27. It reads, Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred, in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abraham and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. In this message where I'm speaking of big structures in the Bible, it's worth noting how the story falls within the structure of Genesis itself. The first 11 chapters of Genesis have been called the primeval history or the prehistory, and we can divide that into two, the era before the flood and then also the era after the flood of the primeval history. In each era, you have a culminating figure. Tenth from Adam is the figure of Noah, and here we have a an important key structurally in the text that we're now 10 out from Noah in the figure of Abram. Both are culminating figures of their era. In Noah, you have a member 
of the righteous seed of the woman preserved from the worldwide destruction of the flood and his family is preserved and they go out and recreate the world. It's a theme of recreation or creation. So too, today as we look at Abram, we'll see that theme of creation and recreation in the passage itself. But with that, let's turn to Genesis 12. I'll start with verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. It moves from the less intimate to the more intimate. Abram is called by God to leave behind his country, the homeland of his extended family, and then his father's house itself. What is clear is that where he is now, Haran, is not where Abram is to remain. God promises to show this land to Abram, and he clarifies later that it is his descendants who will possess it. Abram must leave the known and enter into the unknown. Verses 2 and 3. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. These two verses together comprise seven promises of blessing God is to give to Abram. Seven promises. And on the screen, I've tried to uh, separate them here into seven parts. The Lord said, I will make you, number one, a great nation. A great nation will come from Abram. The word is not people, although a great people will come from Abram, but nation, implying that there will be a government and a territory. Two, God will impart blessing to Abraham, to Abram. Blessing will be upon him. Promise three, Abram's name will be great. That means it will be famous. In context, this shows a great contrast to what happened in Genesis 11. There in Genesis 11 is the incident of the Tower of Babel. There, the builder said expressly, this is to make our name great out of their own arrogance and pride. But here it is through God at his initiative, Abram's name will be great. In, in uh, the fourth promise, the verb is in the different form and it pulls back to verse one. Basically the syntax is this, the verb of verse one, go. By going, you will be a blessing. Abram cannot be a blessing if he stays in Haran. But if he leaves, he will be a blessing. And then five, God's relationship to others will be determined by the relationship of those others to Abram. God will bless those who bless Abram. And the sixth promise is the reverse of that. Those who dishonor, those who curse Abram will be cursed. And then seven is the climax of these, prof of these promises. All the peoples and families of the earth will be blessed. Its ultimate fulfillment will come in the New Testament. After the ascension of Christ, blessing the nations becomes the program of concerted action for the people of God. Well, that's the first scene. Let's turn now to verses 4 through 9 to see Abram responding in faith. Let's start by reading verses 4 through 6. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they, had, when they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the Oak of Moreh, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Abram is presented as a paragon of faith and obedience. He was told by God to go, and he went. Age was no excuse to disobey God. Oh, I'm just, I'm 75, I can't do this. No, he went. The first site at which he stops is Shechem to a specific spot called the Oak of Moray. It's a crossroads between the two mountains. And there God speaks again to Abram, but it's more than speech. Now God appears to Abram. Verse 7. 
Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So going into this new land includes his nephew Lot, Abram's wife, Sarai, we learn from chapter 11, was childless, yet God appears to Abram and tells him his descendants will be given this land. The heir will be Abram's own seed. Now Abram the pilgrim becomes Abram the builder. Abram does whatever is the Old Testament equivalent of putting on overalls and a hard hat, and he gets to building. His intent is neither building a tower. His intent is not to build a city. His intent is to build an altar. Altars were ways of invoking God's name. As in Genesis 26, Isaac builds an altar and calls upon the name of the Lord. He invokes the name of the Lord. Let's read verses 8 and 9. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going towards the Negev. Abram's journey continues and he builds another altar. The contrast of the phrases here is significant. Abram pitched his tent. It's quite the contrast to build an altar. Abram would dismantle the tents. The altars remained. Old Testament worship included both action and word. Action, building an altar, and word, invoking the name of God. Today, we too, in this New Testament era, pitch tents in our lives, tents that will not remain. But as we invoke the word of the Lord, as we call upon his name, we can build remaining spiritual altars unto God. These are not now altars of stone and brick, but altars of transformed lives in light of the gospel message. Abram built for the Lord, not for himself, so should we. We build spiritual temples in the name of the Lord when we proclaim the gospel, and through the instrument of that action, God will build his church. Well, that's chapter 12, but before we move on, there's a couple chapters in between, and it might be good to just glance at those to see the actions that take place until the covenant theme is returned to. So at the end of the chapter, we see Abram and Sarai in Egypt. In chapter 13, Abram and Lot separate themselves and their herds as they return to the place where the first altar was built. In uh, chapter 13, verse 18, Abram settles by the oaks of Mamre in Hebron and there builds even another altar to the, law, to the Lord. And there's two main scenes in chapter 14. Abram rescues Lot from the ravages of warring kings in the valley and Abram is blessed then by Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. There's a lot we could say in those passages, but we need to keep our focus on the covenant. And so we turn to chapter 15, and there God speaks again. So in chapter 15, the covenant ratified. In the first scene, we have Abram's righteousness, verses 1 through 6. I'll start with verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Suddenly, God speaks again. Some time has passed. That's what's meant with after these things. It's been a while since he's heard the Lord. And God now speaks forth. Fear not. Abram confronted warring kings to save Lot. But can man confront Yahweh? and live. That might be behind the fear not. But the fear not may also speak of the promises of Genesis 12, the promises God made with Abram. Where is the promise of a son? Some time has passed since you gave me that promise. How can there be a promise of a great nation if there is not even a son from Abram and barren Sarah, Sarai? God tells Abram that he is his shield, and here we have God playing on words. Abram fought in conflicts, so of course God was his shield of protection, but the word shield also sounds like the word for benefactor, and hence the next phrase, your reward shall be very great because I am your shield benefactor. 
the promises of chapter 12 will come to pass. Verses 2 and 3. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. So in this ancient culture, what one could do is, if, a, if you were a childless man, you could adopt an heir out of your own household, and that person would make sure you're properly buried, and then that person would get the inheritance. Abram asked, what can be his blessing? For his heir is a servant, Eliezer, a servant of his household, who he has adopted as the heir. But reading this carefully, though, we see that it's Abram's faith and not his unbelief that is shining in this answer. He knows the blessing of God is upon him. But what useful purpose would be served by a reward that cannot be transmitted? That question should arrest our attention, too, for our own lives. Receiving the award of salvation through faith, we must seek to transmit that reward as a blessing to others. We can't straight give it, but we can, by proclaiming the path of salvation to the world, lead to salvation by hearing the message of the gospel. Abraham knows, Abram knows the reward will come. And rather than wait for Yahweh to respond, Abram just tries to answer the question for himself. Will Eliezer, his servant, be his heir? But verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. The word not spoken by God is emphatic. It is strong. It is clear. The servant will not be the heir. Your own flesh and blood will be the heir. Literally, the, the phrase reads, from your own body will be the heir. Verse 5, and he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Oh, the great days before light pollution. How many stars did he see in the sky? There will not only be an heir, but the descendants of Abram will be a great multitude. Verse 6, and he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Don't you love the ambiguity of pronouns in English, how they're not clear? And he, Abram, believed the Lord, and he, the Lord, counted it to him, Abram, as righteousness. So in response to these promises, Abram put his faith in God. It is the word believe here is the same word as faith. It's the first time it appears in the Bible. Believe or have faith, the same word. Believe or have faith, that all important word to our theology. That faith, the instrument by which we are saved, by virtue of Abram's earlier, earlier obedient response to the words of God, Abram was putting his faith in God. And his trust, this faith, consists of two things. Abram's faith is personal, and it is propositional. It is personal that it is in the Lord, and it is propositional. It is in the very words that the Lord spoke. The faith was accounted, credited to Abram as righteousness. Well, that's a big word. Righteousness just means the state of being just or morally pure. Faith established Abram as a fitting covenant partner. Faith has brought Abram into saving righteousness. Let's look at the second scene, the ratification of the covenant itself, the promise clarified and covenanted. Let's look at verses 7 and 8. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? So in verse 7, God speaks of what he has done in the past for Abram, bringing him into the land. Abram, in verse 8, asks how he will know it will come to pass to possess this land. And it's to answer that question, the covenant is ratified by the Lord. Let's read verses 9 through 11. He said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. 
And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Well, it's not my purpose today to go into what each individual animal means in this ceremony and go into a deep uh, look into uh, the Hebrew sacrificial system there. But this covenant ratification resembles closely a covenant ritual that is described in more detail in Jeremiah's prophecy. But this covenant ratification also has a similar counterpoint in civil societies, that as nations and other peoples came together and made treaties, the covenant ratification treaty they would make looked very similar, of animals being slaughtered, usually cut in two, And what would happen is a party or both parties would then walk through the carcasses that had been split in half. They would walk through the slaughtered animals. And it was an enacted parable that they were saying, so should this be done to me. So shall I be killed and slaughtered like this if I should break the terms of this treaty. We do have an interesting phrase here of the birds of prey coming down on the carcasses, Abraham driving them away. The prophets Ezekiel and Zechariah will use uh, birds of prey, which are unclean animals, to symbolically represent the enemies of the people of God, these unclean nations. So we might have an enacted parable here of Abram protecting the promise, Abram protecting his descendants of the promise by putting these birds back to flight. Verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. What a day. This ward from the Lord started at night. He looked up at the stars, continued through the day, and now it's nighttime again. And there's this very significant phrase here in this verse, and I could just easily miss it as we move on to the next. A deep sleep fell on Abram. That is the same word for the slumber that fell on Adam back in Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, a deep sleep falls on Adam, and from him God fashions his wife Eve, and from them will be creation, the peoples of the earth. Here too we have that creation theme again by using that same phrase, a deep sleep, and then from Abram will come many descendants, a multitude like the stars of the sky. Verses 13 through 16. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The Lord clarifies the promises to Abram. The land promise is to his descendants, and they will possess the land only after a hiatus of 400 years in bondage and abuse. The persecuting nation is unnamed, but God says he will judge them. Abram will die in peace. You shall go to your fathers in peace, meaning dying with a sense of contentment and fulfillment. Amorite is here used generically as all the different peoples in the land. They will, Abram's descendants, return to this land and possess it. Verse 17, when the sun had gone down it was, and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. The smoke and fire is a manifestation of God, just as the fiery, cloudy pillar of the Exodus was a, was a manifestation of God, just as at Mount Sinai, as God made a covenant with Moses, smoke and fire surrounded the summit of the mountain. So we saw how in a covenant or treaty ratification, a party or both parties might walk through the pieces saying, so should it be done to me if I break the terms of this treaty, of this covenant. But it's God who walks through the pieces. It's quite interesting here. It is God alone bearing the burdens of the terms of this covenant. He will bring his promises to pass 
God is the one unilaterally making the covenant. He initiates it by divine ordination. But the covenant also requires loyalty of both parties. It is bilateral in the duties of God to man and man to God. As Travis prayed from the Valley of Vision, bless us with the faith of Abraham so that we might not sway. It is for Abram not to sway, although it is God initiating the covenant and bearing the burdens of the terms of this covenant. And then verses 18 for 21. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenazites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Well, I won't give a geography lesson today, but that's quite an extensive passage of land they are promised. It is quite extensive. It is ridiculously expansive, and it goes well beyond Canaan. What's interesting is that these boundaries would be known by Israel. This is fulfilled, but only during the reign of King David, and even there for a very, very short time. So what could be the ultimate fulfillment of that land promise? What are the ultimate fulfillments of all of these promises? Very often, the promises of God, prophecy has a near fulfillment in the time and an ultimate fulfillment yet to come. And so in our final section, we'll look at these promises of the Abrahamic covenant fulfilled. So I'll turn now, since we're past Abram, to call him Abraham for the final part and look at the promises fulfilled. Covenants are indeed the basic architectonic structure of the Bible. And the covenant with Abram is repeated again and again through the Old Testament. We have not the time to see so many of the examples there. But it is the Lord remembering his promises to Abraham that initiates the events of the Exodus. When the Lord appears to Moses for the first time, he says, I am the God of Abraham. It is in the covenant with David that David just keeps talking about Abraham. And the language of the Abrahamic covenant is found in that passage as well, 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic covenant. And the prophets speak of the Abrahamic covenant. They are speaking of the Abrahamic covenant when they keep using from the prayer we just had, Hesed, the steadfast love of the Lord. What is the steadfast love of the Lord? His love to keep the promise. But ultimately, Abram, Abraham points us to Christ. The covenant with Abraham points to the global impact of the offspring and land that God had promised to Abraham. The Abrahamic child of the promise must be understood to be believing Israel, all those who persist in faith and repentance. The true Israel of God, as Paul explains in Galatians 6, is the believing remnant, the church. The gospel regularly affirms that you must trust in Jesus to be a son of Abraham. That is true Abrahamic sonship is spiritual, not physical. Thus, the Gentile nations can now be included as the people of God. And that is the message of the Great Commission. The call to gospel living is a call into an exile. Our call might not be a real exile, a physical exile like Abraham faced, of leaving homeland and family, although it could be. But by accepting the gospel by faith, this puts us into a spiritual exile to this fallen world around us. We are not of this world. The fire of this exile is a refining fire that leaves us pure and unalloyed, a true remnant preserved by God. The gospel writers are quick to identify Jesus as faithful Israel, the one who completes the new exodus, by leaving his heavenly abode and pitching his tent among us to work his ministry of redemption, to forge the new covenant in his shed blood on the cross. Jesus as faithful Israel succeeds where the Israel of antiquity failed. Christ is the faithful seed in whom all others can receive the inheritance of Abraham. 
the New Testament speaks deeply of the promises given to Abraham. Matthew opens his gospel by tracing the genealogy of Jesus back to Abraham. In Luke's gospel, Mary, the mother of Jesus, finds out that she is pregnant with the Messiah, and she sings a song of praise. It is a song of praise about the promises God gave to Abraham. Therefore, the Apostle Paul contends that Jesus Christ is the singular offspring to whom the covenant with Abraham points. He says this in Galatians 3, 16. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. Paul is at pains to show in Galatians that a works principle has not replaced the faith principle of the covenant with Abraham. Abraham's covenant is still in effect because it is a covenant of saving faith. Faith is the saving measure. Between the covenant with Abraham and the new covenant, Paul's at pains to show that there is continuity. In that continuity, the descendants of Abraham are identified as those who believe in Christ. So Paul could conclude can conclude in Galatians 3, starting at verse 26. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. God's intention was that his people in every age would be justified through faith in Christ solely on the basis of Christ's own merits. It is Christ's work that justifies and not our own, makes us righteous before God, blameless before God. Before the incarnation of Christ, God revealed Christ to his people in his promises to them, preeminently in those promises made with Abraham. For this reason, Abraham exemplifies the way the people of God across redemptive history are justified or saved in Christ. This is what Paul tells us in Galatians 3.9. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. The promise to Abraham that his offspring would bless the world is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the righteous seed through whom all the nations will be brought into the divine program of redemption through saving faith. In Christ, the nations are being gathered into the inheritance of Abraham. That is a work being done even now through the Great Commission. The inclusion of the nations will be completed in the new heavens and the new earth. Too often, commentators have gotten hung up on those land promises of the extent of the land that we read about that Israel only held for a very short, brief time. That's because it pointed to something even more expansive. It pointed to its ultimate fulfillment being the whole world is ours through faith. The global scope of the promises to Abraham imply that the divine work of redemption was never meant to stop at the borders of Israel, nor was it ever meant to be limited to the biological descendants of Abraham. Paul explained this in Romans 4, verse 13. For the promise to Abraham and to his offspring that he would be heir of the world, of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Abraham and his offspring by faith were always meant to be heirs of the world. Justification, being credited righteous before God, is granted not to those who work for God, but to those who trust in God. Paul tells us how righteousness, the right relationship of being blameless before God, how it is credited. Romans 4, 24 and 25. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. That is, what does it mean to trust in God? Paul explains it to us in Romans 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, 
and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Please bow your heads and close your eyes. In this somber posture, in this meditative stance, search your hearts and hear these final words. Faith comes by the Holy Spirit and is a gift of God. It comes by the free gift of grace. Abraham did not simply believe, he embraced faith. In believing God's word and believing God's promises, he embraced faith. And faith is living, active, and vital. The faith that saves is dynamic and powerful. Faith is more than agreeing that certain things happened in history. True faith sees the splendor of Christ, who is the seed of Abraham. Faith opens our eyes to the beauty and loveliness of Christ Jesus. Faith puts our trust in God's word and promises. Faith looks to another for salvation, so that salvation is by grace alone, in Christ alone. I therefore must ask all who are hearing me this following question. Have you believed and trusted in Christ Jesus alone for your salvation? Salvation is in no other name but Jesus. If you say you have trusted in him, has your life changed? If you say no, I call on you to trust in God's promises to save, to know the love of God in Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we pray for faith. We pray for a faith that does not wish fulfillment. We pray for a faith that does not seek faith in faith itself. Lord, grant us a faith that trusts in your promises, just as Abraham trusted that his offspring would be as many as the stars of the sky. Lord, grant to us a faith that puts our hope in you, a true faith that knows our sins are forgiven. May we believe in the security of our forgiveness and justification of being made righteous before you through trust and faith in Jesus' death and resurrection, the salvation he purchased for us. This faith displays itself in a new kind of life. So, Lord, may we walk in the obedience of faith. Amen.